Hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and we're delighted that all of you could be here to join us this evening for a very special event. We are doing a preview screening of American Denial by Llewellyn Smith, who will be introduced in just a moment, but I did want to say that we're delighted that he traveled to join us here this evening. I also would like to start by thanking our co-sponsors, so in particular the National Center for Institutional Diversity and also the Institute for Social Research, and we're delighted that the Managing Director Marvin Parnes is with us here this evening. Great to see you. Um, and this evening wouldn't have been possible without the assistance of Women's Studies Professor James Hessinger, who helped to connect us with Llewellyn Smith, and so thank you very much for that. We're delighted to have you join us as well. Well, as you all know, recent events have sparked a national dialogue, actually an ongoing dialogue on race dynamics in the United States. The Ford School and the University of Michigan have been involved in a variety of ways, and in particular through the month-long symposium in honor of Martin Luther King, Jr. And this featured event is a part of those symposium activities. It is a great privilege for me to be able to welcome our special guests who are here with us this evening as part of that event. And let me start with producer director Llewellyn Smith. We are again delighted that you are here with us today. He has engaged the contemporary, on contemporary social justice issues and American history through a great number of films that I suspect many in the audience are very familiar with. In particular, let me highlight Eyes on the Prize, American Civil Rights Years, Africans in America, America's Journey Through Slavery, and there are a great many others. He also served as series editor for the superb PBS series, The American Experience, that I suspect many of you, like me, saw and found extremely provocative and informative. He's also co-founder co of the Blue Spark Collab uh, Collaborative, which is a media company producing films that challenge perceptions of race and encourage intercultural conversations. And he also examines some of the underlying structures that really help to foster inequality in the United States. And in recognition of his many major achievements, he has won the Peabody, the DuPont, and Emmy Awards. And so uh, that's quite a quite an impressive um, feat, and so um, we are particularly honored to have you here with us this evening. Thank you for being here. Martha Jones is an associate professor here at the University of Mich Michigan with appointments in history, African American studies, and law. She earned an Arthur F. Thurnau um, professorship, which as many of you know means that she's a superb teacher. Those are uh, distinguished teaching awards. Um, her work examines slavery and freedom, citizenship, and the rights of women. She's also an active writer, and I suspect that those of you who are on Twitter have read her political commentary on issues of rights and race in the United States. She's also a gifted author, and I look forward to her forthcoming book, which is entitled Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America. So thank you very much, Martha, for joining us this evening. And last but certainly not least, the Ford School's own Joy Rohde, who is an assistant professor here. She will moderate the discussion after the screening. Um, and Joy is a historian whose teaching includes courses in ethics as well as science and technology. She's also a phenomenal teacher, I should mention. Um, her book, Armed with Expertise, was published in 2013. She's very interested in the role that social scientists play in domestic and foreign policy debates, and I suspect that she, like me, shares um, fellow historians' uh, affinity for Gunnar Myrdal, who is um, featured very prominently in the film that we are about to see shortly. Just a quick note about format. We will begin um, with the moderated discussion immediately after the screening. Our speakers will have a brief discussion among themselves and then open the floor for uh, comments and questions from the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We do have volunteers with microphones, and please wait for a microphone um, before you speak and ask your question. For those watching online, we are delighted to take your comments through Twitter, so you may tweet your questions using the hashtag AmericanDenialDoc. With that, I would like to invite our special guest, Llewellyn Smith, to the podium to introduce his film. Uh, 
good, good evening, and thanks for, um, first of all, I want to say I'm really honored and excited to be here to screen the film with you. Um, I don't often have a chance to screen a film that I produce or direct with an audience, so this is a unique experience for me. Uh, a couple of, one, one housekeeping note, uh, the film will be broadcast, American Denial will be broadcast on PBS Tuesday, February 24th. So this is at 11 p.m. So this is actually a, this is, I think, uh, one of the few screenings that I'm aware of of the film before it's broadcast. Um, it continue, I would say just a couple of words and then I, I, I think the film should just uh, play and speak for itself. Uh, but I would say it does continue my interest in looking at history as a way of interrogating how we understand the present um, and, um, and looking at the way in which famous figures' uh, lives help us understand something about ourselves and about how we are shaping and, and examining the world. Uh, that said, I would um, let the film play, and we'll have a discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lou, for such a fantastic film. This is the second time I've seen it, and I'm glad I'm not a discussant, because uh, it's the second time it's left me speechless. Um, so I would like to turn the floor over. The way that this format is going to work now is that um, our discussants are going to have a conversation about the film just briefly for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then I'll open the floor up to your questions. We really want to hear um, especially from you today. So Lou and Martha, please. So thanks very much, Joy. Um, it's really a, a treat and an honor for me to be here um, with Lou. Um, I've had the distinct um, pleasure to have a chance to talk with you um, over the last week about this film and the ideas underneath it. So um, I'm just going to jump in and get us started. Um, I think my first question is um, one that maybe other people are asking also, which is sort of why Myrdal, why an American dilemma, why now? In other words, why come back to this study, uh, to this moment? Um, on the one hand, I think we could suggest that Myrdal and his moment are remote in time, um, a pre-civil rights moment, um, a moment that predates um, the explosion in um, scholarship, including um, economics and history and sociology, anthropology, all um, taking up the questions that uh, Myrdal asks. Um, so why now? Um, you know, I'm a you know I'm a historian, and um, I'm a little um, I'm a little skeptical about the um, historical analogies, right? Which is to say, so much has changed, unless. But at the same time, my sense is that you thought there was something. Um, quite important that Myrdal had to offer us for thinking about the present? Um, that's a good question. Uh, the film uh, originated uh, among myself and uh, other producers, uh, Christine Herbie Subbers and also um, uh, Kelly Thompson, when we were working on another film, uh, which we've talked about a bit, um, Herskovitz at the Heart of Blackness. And uh, Myrdal's story came up in the film, and we wanted to tell a little bit about it, and we decided we couldn't. But we saw that as an opportunity to explore his story in a, in a separate film. And uh, one of the things I, I think that was very compelling for me about his story is that he's, um, he's fundamentally asking a question, which I think is a kind of, um, in my view, a kind of eternal question, which is, who are we as a society? and who are we as Americans and who are Americans? And uh, another way to think about it is who gets to be an American? Um, he's not so crass, but I think there's a fundamental question there that he's asking. Um, we have values, we have beliefs about what citizens, what it means to be a citizen, what a citizen should enjoy, what kind of rights a citizen should enjoy. Is this true for all of us? And do we all share this? And in Myrdal's time, he was essentially coming to the conclusion that he was seeing something that was profoundly skewed from 
the extraordinary values that he uh, embraced and he uh, honored in America and that the world was honoring in America and the world does honor in America. And uh, the, que the answer for him was that the problem was not with the people who were being denied those opportunities, who were being debased, the people who were being repressed or oppressed. It was really, as he, as he, as he says in his writing, fundamentally, it's something that is embodied in the structures and the institutions and the mind of America. And I think that what we're trying to pose in the question, in the film rather, is the question, uh, is that true today? And I think that's, uh, I think for, in my, in my opinion, for any people who are concerned with social justice, concerned with, 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 with understanding who we are as a people and do we, um, do we honor justice truly, that's a question that continues to need to be answer, asked. That's not, a, that's not a historical question. That's a, as I said, that's an eternal question. Um, and so I think this is just the moment when we were asking that question. The film actually was, and, I, and I'll, I'll wind up by saying the film, we started production on this film, my gracious, I wish I could remember, at least, I'm gonna say about four years ago. I think we started the first, we received the first small grant and began to try to build out the film. So it's not like we, thought that this would be a great film for this moment. I think there are a lot of things that are happening in this moment and time that really begin to resonate with the questions that are being asked. But it's been a long time, uh, a long, long journey, and the film has had many different iterations before it's come to be what, what you saw. So would it be fair to ask you whether um, this is an optimistic film or a pessimistic film? Um, I think in watching, I felt like I sort of tacked between those two um, points of view, um, and then there's that moment when um, Michelle Alexander, who, um, whose important, important book, um, The New Jim Crow, really um, lays out a, a historical and sort of sociological analysis of the contemporary moment through the question of mass incarceration. Um, even Alexander says, but I'm not that pessimistic. And I wonder, as a filmmaker, um, do you have that license to be, how, where is the license in being optimistic or pessimistic or having a point of view? We, we talked earlier about being an artist and about having the capacity to put questions on the table. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to understand better sort of where you think the film um, sort of comes down on what is clearly, and it you know it seems like an eternal question, like an ever-present question. Um, uh, it's it's a, it's a very good question. Um, I was when I'm listening, to, I was listening to your question, and I was remembering that um, that moment where Michelle Alexander says, um, "But I'm not so pessimistic." And I remember going. We, I remember. Uh, I I remember a discussion in the edit room and a discussion within myself about, are we gonna let her say that last phrase? Mm -hmm. You know, it was really, because when you come to the, uh, there was a point at the coming to the film where at least thinking about it as a narrative, um, my feeling was I did not, I really, I'm trying to create, um, I, I, we talked about discomfort. I'm trying to create a kind of creative I think we were trying to create, a, that, that's my vision, I think, in terms of the producers, I think is also a sense of this, trying to create a creative discomfort for the audience, a real discomfort. And there's a desire not to let the audience off the hook, that's my feeling. So even the last bit of text that says that the, the US, the, the, the New York courts, you know, struck down this, this law against, about uh, frisking, there was some controversy about whether you should include that because, because, and then I'll come to the, I think I'll come to the answer of what you're, there's a long way to get to your answer because I think that it's important for us to, um, to really struggle with these questions in a real way. Um, and so in the film I'm trying to, I feel as a director, I want to create a space where uh, those answers are not easy and you can't really get away from the discomfort and what you're beginning to talk about, which is a kind of sort of pessimism. I don't feel, I don't think the film is so much pessimistic as it's really, f I, and, I, and I, think, I think that uh, Kelly and Christine would agree, it's, 
it's forcing, it's trying to force us to ask really hard, difficult questions that are not the answers which may not come so easily or so comfortably. And if we can do that, I think that that's an optimistic thing, actually. I think in the difficulty of being able to do that creates a kind of optimism for me. Um, I think the pessimism comes when we say that this is a question we can slip by, this is a question that we really, somebody else can address, I don't need to address. I think that's the response that makes me feel uh, pessimistic about what, what might happen, what, what the possibilities are for us on this issue. So you, you opened the door to um, uh, this scene, right, behind the scenes, which is um, the debates that are going on um, among you as, as creative folks behind this film. So I have to ask you about the decision to include um, that image of, um, I think it's a young Trayvon Martin. Am I, am I mistaken? No, well, that's really interesting. It's yeah. not. We, we actually wanted to include Trayvon Martin, and uh, there was a, the, there was an image that we actually had in the film for a long time. And what happened was that we couldn't um, get the rights to the image. We, there, it, I, and I think it was just that we, it, the, the conversations, it, just, it wasn't that we were denied, it's just we just couldn't in time get a clear, honest answer that yes, you can use this image. And so we decided we would not use it. But we did, you're right, you, we were trying to, with the image that we used, we were trying to, to, to bring that to the fore. Um, you made me think of one thing when I was watching the film, and I just want to say this. This was, it's interesting in terms of just the creative experience. The, um, that scene where we have um, the young people being frisked, uh, which is a scene I directed and, and we conceived that scene. Um, those are high school kids. The two guys actually behind them are both filmmakers. They're not really cops. Mm -hmm. But the kids, when they did this scene, it was really interesting because we sort of blocked the scene and walked through it just the way you would in a feature film. And now this is going to happen. Now we're going to do this shoot. And it's all shot with stills. It's not filming. So it's hundreds of stills that we're building into the scene. And I remember after we did the frisking part, these guys were, you, two things happened. One is you can see their body and their faces change. Um, and part of it is because uh, they've been frisked a lot. Mm -hmm. And what, one of the things that they said to me was, after we shot this, he said, actually, when the cops do this, they're way rougher with us than you were. Um, so it was, it was one of those moments where you, you think that you really understand the reality of what you're trying to portray, and then after you sort of put it together, they're saying, no, no, it's, it's way worse than this. Um, and um, how they're physical bodies changed from we're acting to no, this is really happening, was very powerful, for me anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to assert my privilege as moderator and turn your question around, um, your first question to you, Martha, which is, um, can you talk a little bit about the ways in which you see gaps between Myrdal's argument, his assessment, um, and, and what we're experiencing today. Or, and, and another piece, which you may or may not have an answer for, which is, um, you know, if not Myrdal, what other figures might we want to think of in terms, historical figures, um, that might be maybe more resonant? It's a great question. Um, on the one hand, I think that, um, I, I don't think today um, we might, um, lean as heavily as Myrdal did on this notion that there was um, that there was a, a, a higher American ideal, right? I, I, I think today um, we might more rely on a narrative that suggests about the ways in which inequality, racism, colonialism um, are themselves elements of the American creed. Mm -hmm. um, and so, whereas I think um, it doesn't mean politically and rhetorically that we still don't hold the nation up to those ideals as Myrdal maps them out, um, but I think that is um, in some sense more rhetorical, uh, more strategic than it is analytic. And that in the analysis, I think we would say, right, slavery, racism, genocide um, are, are all 
part of the founding fabric of the nation, um, that um, it is that um, paradox, that dilemma, that is the American dilemma. It's not the disjuncture between the creed um, and the ideals. Um, it is the way in which um, the lived experience of, for example, people of color, um, or those who we come to call people of color, um, are part of the foundational fabric. Um, my other reflection in, in watching this is, um, on the other hand, I was hard pressed to um, point to, and gosh, I wouldn't do this in front of a live room, point to who I think might be a peer to Myrdal today, because I'd leave someone out and offend someone, maybe. Um, but more to the point, I, I was just struck by um, Myrdal's um, range and ambition as an intellectual. I had forgotten uh, that he was trained as an economist um, because so much of what we um, learn um, from an American dilemma is um, about psychology, sociology, um, and so this um, style of an intellectual um, who's um, you know interdisciplinary long before places like the University of Michigan you know sort of trade on that notion right he just is working that way um, because it makes sense and it's a part of his ambition so in that way um, it's quite um, remarkable to um, to um, imagine that way of working and he's also working outside the academy. Um, in this moment, right? So he's working for Carnegie, which is this extraordinary um, project in and of itself um, that is neither the academy nor the state um, that has this uh, enormous um, worldview about um, race, about racism and race relations, and is doing many things in this period in addition to commissioning Myrdal's study um, Carnegie is, is, is um, you know, sort of a core philanthropist, right, in the very circumstances that Myrdal is studying. So um, that's very hard to um, point to the parallel, the easy parallels, I think. Um, so we've taken our 15 minutes, and we could probably go forever, but uh, we would like to open up the floor now for discussion. There are two mics circulating. Uh, Cliff has one. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the film. It was, uh, if your purpose was to generate discomfort, I believe you succeeded. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask a question about an American dilemma itself, this master work of social science. Um, I believe Myrdal wrote two books, a really thin one, which is the one that people read, the beginning of the two volume set, mm -hmm. and the rest of it. Mm -hmm. and What's impressive to me is the mountain of evidence that he collected, compiled with a very substantial staff um, on the problem of racism and racial discrimination, how deeply entrenched it was. Um, the portrait he paints of, of the American South and the Great Depression and the way African Americans in particular suffered is very hard to read, but extremely powerful. And, and there are chapters on uh, corruption in the political system and uh, the uh, police as tools of oppression and violence. You know, it's just one thing after another, horrible thing after another. And at the very beginning of the book, he writes this, I think, concoction of a conflict between our commitment to moral values on the one hand and our practice of racial discrimination on the other. And if you only read the first part of the book, it's quite optimistic. How could he come to that? having written his other book. And so this gets back to a point that Martha Jones made earlier, uh, pointing to Michelle Alexander, who uh, makes a very compelling persuasive case about mass incarceration as a tool of racial domination. And she says in your film, nevertheless, I'm feeling pretty optimistic about the future. I don't, I, well. <laughs> but I, I, hear, I hear you, I hear you. Right, and, and you, weren't sure that that, would, that should be part of the film. Okay, I get that, but, um, so this is a question, I suppose, primarily about an American dilemma. How do you reconcile his extremely persuasive 
thousand page book about the, the entrenched problem of racial discrimination in America on the one hand, and this uh, story at the beginning about how if we just live up to our values, the problem of race discrimination will go away. I don't, I, don't, I mean, you, you may have some thoughts about this. I don't know that he's, 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 he's only saying if we just live up to our values. I think that he's, I think that he's, um, and I think the question, I think the question of values is a really tough one. I mean, I think that it, just as a side note, I think, I think it was very important to have the, you know, the, the note from Ralph Bunch who basically says this is, you know, I, I'm not with you on this. I don't think that people are really so absorbed about this as you are. And in fact, among his staff, there's some controversy of whether that was really, you know, the, the appropriate or, the, or the, the, the power lens. But I mean, I think that, I think that uh, just from, and, and, and this is a slightly, I don't know, this is not an academically informed view, but I, I think that there are several things going on, and I think they have to do with the very thing that he's trying to examine and explain, which is there is denial going on. I think he's trying to embrace this idea of America in a, in a almost, the word is not romantic, but it's, but it's a very, it, he's in trying, these, this, the idea that these values are really quite profound for him. And one of the things he talks about and writes about is that in, in Europe and especially in Sweden, there's no, there is no fundamental statement, you know, that the state that, that, that's in the documents about, this is who we are as Swedes, this is what we believe, this is what we stand for, this is what we believe all Swedes should. There's nothing like that. And I think the, the fact of such, such um, a statement about uh, these ideals was very had a very profound effect for him. Um, at the same time, uh, and I think he did have genuine um, affection and real hope for the country. At the same time, I think that you're right. How do you reconcile that against what he's looking at, which is, uh, in the end, it adds up to a, you know, profoundly almost corrupt sort of a system, a history that goes on f further back than we want to think. Um, of oppression and racism, um, so I, I, I think that I think there's, there's a I think that there's a I think that what you're kind of implying is that there is a kind of a there is a kind of a, um, a dance he's trying to do a bit, but at the same time, but at the same time I think that again I'm not sure that uh, it's unjust to sort of say he's being disingenuous. I don't, I don't think it's just to say he's being disingenuous. I think that. Um, the last thing I would say is I'm not sure how you can, how you could, um, I imagine, I'm trying to imagine him, I'm trying to imagine him sort of reconcile those two things and I think it's pretty, it's a very big challenge in a place that he has great affection and connections with and also trying to understand how it can also, also be this other piece that he's just discovered that he's never been part of, that he's never seen. Um, that's a kind of a... Well, and, and I thought for me it's the moment when you, um, when you focus in on his um, relationship with Alva, mm. right, that you suggest a kind of thesis, a, a lens through which we might understand um, Myrdal, um, but we might understand ourselves as our profound capacities for denial. Um, and at least for, for me in thinking about where we are in um, the mid 20th century, you know, we're on the cusp not only of a civil rights revolution, but a, a women's rights revolution. Um, and it seems to me, um, Myrdal, not in any way to let him off the hook, is, is, is of a moment, right, in, in which um, he's, he's quite capable of, of not seeing, right, the, the questions that um, he's deeply, in, you know, that are Clearly, sort of, yeah. he's deeply embedded in. I think thanks as well for the presentation and the discussion. Um, and uh, I was thinking about a, a strain or uh, maybe a tension that I think is in both American Dilemma and at least the elements of which I think are in the film, which is uh, minds versus structures. And maybe not somewhat piggybacking on what you were saying, a lot of American Dilemma is talking about psychology, attitudes, belief, the, this American psyche, which the film rather goes into. And then, but we, and, and, and you know, talks about how that was in Brown v. Board and the D Clark Dahl study that it's about attitudes and beliefs. Um, but then we do have Myrtle saying we need large structural reforms. I think that tension continues because that, um, I mean, not necessarily um, people citing 
American Dilemma, but the myth of that it's just about attitudes and beliefs, um, and no one would say attitudes and beliefs are unimportant, but rather than looking at the arrow of causality from institutions, structures, historical inequality, and uh, you know, um, state promotions and public policies leading that, and thus coming up, you know, Myrtle was, wasn't really, he talked about big structural reforms, he wasn't really policy prescriptive, but we can be. Um, but I think that's, at least the elements of that tension are, are, I think both in American Dilemma and the film, and I think those continue with us today. We can look at issues like affirmative action where that tension is the case of leading, at least legal def defenses where it's been upheld is, it's diversity and really of the white mind or will benefit the white mind, the white student will benefit from attitudes and beliefs, not unlike his, which again, no one's gonna say that's unimportant, but doesn't say, oh, we need to say, for, for example, do affirmative action or other remedies as a part of the least we can do to remedy uh, historical and ongoing racial inequality. But I wonder if you had that, you saw that tension or see that tension, whether or, or doing the film or any of you um, ongoingly in any kind of interesting way. This comes back to you know um, what you were saying about Miron and sort of the blindness. I mean, I think the thing that we sort of begin to, at least for me, I think it's important to remember. I, I, I think it's very important is that you know we can talk about structures and we talk about policy, but our policies are are created by minds. They're peopled, you know. So uh, again, I mean, I think that there is I think there is a tension between we want to say that we could sort of create these policies. There, these things could actually happen, but. Again, who's in the room and who's a part of the conversation about what these policies are going to be, and and I think that's a, I think that's not an insignificant, um, that's not an insignificant, blind spot, you know, it, just as Myrtle, you know, has these you know tremendous ideas and this amazing intellect and he's got this amazing vision that he can execute, he's got this one amazing blind spot, which is that he's an absolute, you know, you know. Uh, unreconstructed patriarch, and his wife, you know, f eventually calls him on it in an extraordinary way. Um, there, so it's it's sort of to me it's that's the, it's a similar kind of a thing, which is that there's 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 the stru there's the structure, but the structure is also people. The structure is also shaped. It also comes from someplace. It doesn't, you know, policies and and and, and the institutions that build them don't just sort of appear out of thin air. So I think that's part of the that is part of the tension. And I would describe that as the question of the who's at the table question. I guess connected to that, to me, one of the um, moments that really stuck with me is when you remind us, um, A, that um, Carnegie can't imagine um, an African-American social scientist um, running this study. Um, so Especially a black social scientist. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And then, um, and then Bunch being, um, you know, sort of the the lone, you know, sort of African American figure, and, and ultimately a critic, right? In, in some sense, he was, he was a, he was he wasn't the lone he wasn't the I'm sorry he wasn't the lone figure, but he was he was certainly clear the most important and the most impressive and the most dynamic of yeah you're absolutely right. Um, I'm sorry, where are you going? Uh, no, it, it, just to say, I think it, it goes to it's one of those spots where you can think about how. Um, minds and structure, right, um, are intersecting, right, in, in that moment when um, Carnegie um, has a, they, they have a vision for what this should be, right, and it's partly about the structure and who's at the table and, and the structure, the deep structures of American philanthropy and all of those things coming to play, um, but it's also a space in which um, you've got those more intimate sort of scenes between Myrdal and Bunch, you know, where we see also attitudes coming to bear. So, um, so maybe I, I'm just trying to suggest that there are spaces where it's not, where we can see the two and play, and that's part of what's interesting for me about yeah. the film. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really interesting because, you know, um, um, many folks here may already know, W.B. Bo w. B. Du Bois essentially invented, you know, American sociology, and he's in America, and he's not somebody that they want to bring on. I mean, so there's, there, there again is this, this, this idea of policy and this institution with this great vision, 
but there's an extraordinary blind spot. And their assumption is it's going to have to be someone outside of America, and it's going to almost certainly, absolutely, without much question anywhere, be a white person. That's who they're looking for. And that says a lot about them, and it says a lot about the moment. I mean, there's a real powerful tension there. You know, here's what we want to do. It's high-minded. It's wonderful. Nobody can do it. And we're just as blind as everybody else that we're trying to, as a society that we're trying to understand. Um, I'm hearing a lot of things described as questions, which to me aren't questions at all. Um, they've really been answered and, and very concretely and particularly over the last, let's say 25, 30 years by the, the gentleman down here said the mounds of evidence that Gunnar Myrdal put together, but there have been mounds and mounds and mounds and mounds and mounds and mounds and mounds, hundreds and hundreds of books, films like this one and, and other great films that have been produced that clear up things that are being described right now as questions. It is unquestionable that this country was created with a racial hierarchy built right into the structure. It is unquestionable that, that, that the way that our minds are not allowed to see the disconnection between the so-called freedoms and our ideals and the reality that we live has been skewed and has been uh, uh, told in story form and has been played out for us in our history books in thousands of different ways that prevent us from being able to see those connections. We have not taught it in school. When I was a kid, you know, I went to school every single day, said the Pledge of Allegiance, every single day. Pledge of Allegiance, liberty and justice for all. Ended it that way. Never thought, never thought of the massive contradiction that existed between what I was saying and the way, and I, I grew up first 15 years of my life under legal Jim Crow segregation, never thought to compare what I was saying with the reality that I lived because my teachers, my, the society in general didn't make those connections, didn't allow us to see those connections. It had a story, it had an explanation for why things were the way they were. And a big part of that explanation was the pathology of race, that black people were pathological as a racial group. Now today, we tell a different story, and, and John Powell in the film addressed this when he talked about how in the past they would have said that you know black people are racially deficient. Today they say we're culturally deficient, and that's the explanation that we all get. You know that we deserve to be arrested, that we're criminals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And other people of color get the same kinds of and and different stories, but similar stories as well. So to me, the dilemma is not so much. How can we, con how do we continue to not make those connections as how do we get that information, the mounds and mounds and mounds of information out into the broader, the general public, um, get it, I call it down to the streets. How do we get that down to the streets? This film is better than we're giving it, than this discussion is giving it credit for being. It unearths, it reveals a ton of wonderful stuff. It's wonderful that Michelle Alexander is in there. It's wonderful that John Powell is in there. And they're saying things that could help to, to pull the veil away from our eyes. But, so the question is, how do we get those, and the implicit bias, I could go on and on, and I, I know I'm talking a long time, but um, how do we get that stuff down to the street? How do we get it out into, the, into the, the general public? And how do we stop talking about these things as if we don't have the answers? They're not, they're not questions for a lot of us. They're very, very clear. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, that, that's the sixty-four thousand dollar question. <laughs> no, I, really, because I think that I think that, you know, one of the things that's powerful about film um, that doesn't happen with, you know, one of the things that, that's powerful about film is that it, it it is accessible. It's immediately accessible. And, and, and one of the, the challenges that in terms of the streets, in terms of just, I think you're talking about the public, you're talking about, I presume you're talking about the public, you're talking about into other communities in terms of just getting it out there. Um, film, is, films make, film makes many of these ideas really, really powerfully accessible. I think the, the challenge is, um, my challenge, the challenge for me has always been a question of distribution. 
you know. And <laughs> That's a very good question too. <laughs> the the fund that's that's what you should do if that's really a concern. Seriously, is you should talk to your local public television station because the way that the, the way that ITVS is scheduled, unfortunately, is it really has a lot to do with local stations and what they want, where they want to put it. And our film is is a part of the ITVS series, so um, so that's part of it. But the other part of it is. I'm especially interested in trying to in trying to understand how these things happen and are available even outside of broadcast. You know, I'm excited about the broadcast. I'm excited about festivals, but it's also something that could have a, a life in in uh, communities. It could have a life in, in environments like this and in, in, in teaching institutions and so on. And that's something I hope is going to happen as well. This is the third time I've seen this film, and um, I'm more thrilled each time and see more to ponder and to make use of. Um, I think the question about what do we do with it is, is really pertinent. But uh, I want to say that I appreciate this film in part because of its complexity, its multidisciplinarity. It's looking into multiple streams of scholarship, and it's resisting a tendency to participate in processes that uh, slice and dice are thinking about complex social problems. Um, I'm a psychoanalyst, and so I'm concerned with how the mind gets sliced and diced. And I know that, or, uh, or how identity is built around processes that are about splitting um, and about the repudiation of that which is uncomfortable and painful and ugly. Um, and uh, if, we're in, if we continue to engage, both at a large social level and as an in individual level, in that kind of repu repudiation, unconsciously, um, we can't make the kinds of changes. But you've given, us, uh, you've given us ways to think about that repudiation and ways to become curious about the organization of our own minds and our own thinking. And I really, really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Sylvia Pedraza, Professor of Sociology and American Culture. Um, I want to defend um, Gunnar Myrtle's choice of uh, pointing out the contradiction between the American creed and the values that we hold dear and the actual uh, practices. Uh, because I think that, for example, when one compares the history of race relations in the United States and in Latin America in the Caribbean, there's a number of differences, but there and, and profound similarities. You know, they both start with the institution of slavery, but then, but in the end, in the Caribbean and Latin America, you end up with a much softer pattern of race relations. I call it softer because that's what the literature calls it, and I don't know what else to call it. But basically, there was no Jim Crow, uh, a much larger mixed race population, and much. Uh, closer relationships in terms of friendships, for example, and neighborhood patterns than in the United States. You know, so the United States is a much more, uh, you know, hard, uh, harder case of race relations. Okay, uh, and one of the differences between the two, why, why do you get such different outcomes when the beginnings are so much more similar? Um, one of the differences between the two is that in the United States there is the statement of a creed and also the contradiction and the denial of that, of that creed. Uh, in actual practice. It's not the only one. There are different patterns of colonization. Um, you know, uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese are one thing and the British are another. Um, there's different family structures and gender patterns, different rates of manumission for whatever set of reasons. There's just a lot more freed people uh, from slavery in the Caribbean than there is in the south of the United States. There is a number of differences. I'm not going to boil it down to one, but I think that one key difference is that in the United States there is a statement about who we are and who we believe, what we believe in, that doesn't exist in Latin America. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, that was, that was Myrdal's point. That was one of the things that attracted him was that he did, it didn't he didn't see it in Europe, he didn't see it in his own country. Yeah. Questions? Okay. 
Yeah, I just wanted to um, make a comment about um, the title denial and this kind of piggybacks on what the psychoanalyst and also going to what the gentleman said about the mound of evidence. It really seems that, you know, the film is great. This is, you know, really powerful documentary, but we've got tons of these things and it seems that it's not so much the content that, you know, presenting, it's dealing with the recipients, with the, you know, we're talking about the whole public here in terms of addressing issues of denial. How do you go about that in terms of specifically trying to break down those defense mechanisms that are going on? That's, that's a really powerful block. And, and I'm not sure just as, as much uh, evidence, you know, in films and information that we put out that it gets through because, you know, this has been going on since the framers, you know, the Constitution. That, be, denial began, you know, <coughs> right back then with the, the people that penned uh, the Constitution. So, I, I, and this is what I say, I'm very, you know, I'm, a lot of us are probably very frustrated with media and with our leaders in terms of not trying to approach that. And it has to be approached, you know, in a sophisticated way to try to break through defense mechanisms of people. And you need to have the people there at the top who are um, savvy to that, which, you know, I guess, is questionable. Um, and it seems that we have a very opportune time right now because we are resurrecting all these issues. They're fresh right now. But what's going on is we have two camps going on. It's just falling back into the old patterns and a lot of defense mechanisms are kicking in. And, and uh, you know, you can look at New York City and de Blasio and the police and the protesters. I mean, it's just, that, but there's an opportunity there if it could be grasped by the right folks to really use this to, you know, make those connections and have that, that dialogue start, so just come. Yeah, I mean, I, one of the things that I think you, you're, you're touching on is, you know, the, I think when we, when we uh, create films like this, when filmmakers create films, at least I think in terms of the work that we, we're doing as filmmakers, you know, there's no silver bullet and we, I don't imagine that people are gonna take this film and suddenly it's gonna be, oh, we, we, you know, the lights are gonna go on and that's the end of it. I think there are several things I would say. One is that part of the importance of what happens with the film is, that, is what happens afterwards and also whether there are conversations or whether there are situations like this where people can actually talk about it. I think that's one thing. And I think the other thing is that we're trying to, um, even in creating this film and not having a sense that several years later that we were gonna be in this sort of sort of political moment in America where, where you know, race is sort of in your face and back on the table in such a visceral sort of important way. I think that uh, even without knowing that, what we're trying to do is to create a piece that act, a film that, uh, that can be part of a public conversation, that can be part of what's already sort of being discussed around these issues. And, and there's always been, um, a, a constructive or a sidelined or a dead end or a inspiring or a devolving or a fragmented conversation around race, it just doesn't go away. And so when we created it, we wanted to be part of that. Um, and I think that the last thing I would say is that anything that, anything that um, in my view, and we were talking about this earlier, but anything that begins to sort of encourage us to see, uh, you know, and this, sound, this is gonna sound sort of trite, but to begin to rec see, see this question of race as a human question, that this question of racism as a human question that involves all of us, that affects us, you know, I think is very powerful. I mean, in some ways, that's really the power of what, you know, when you, when you started to defend Gunnar Myrtle, I mean, that sort of brings us back to the power and the importance of what it means, the difference between what, I, what the law says and what I believe. You know, the law can provide all kinds of remedies, but do I believe that when your children are harmed, that's the same as my children getting harmed? Do I believe if I'm a teacher that I, I've got to struggle to make sure that all the children that are in front of me get the same thing? What do I actually believe? And I think that's what we're trying to begin to probe in a way that's very difficult to sort of get to. 
Um, we all can talk about what we think the law should be and we all should obey the law and the law should be for everybody, but there's something else that we're trying to get to in the film which is a bit more, um, from, to my mind, which really drives society and drives the questions that we're talking about. You know, they're, at some level, it's, they're not legal questions. At some level, it's about what do we believe about equality? How do we live it? What really happens when we're in those situations? And, how, and, and so that's what we're trying to really explore. And I think that anything that begins to put that on the table in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an undeniable way or an important way is a very important piece of this conversation as well. I, um, so I'm going to put you gently on the spot because um, <laughs> you, oh, sure. you offered up a, a really, I think a, a really, what was for me a powerful and a provocative um, way of thinking about racism and the um, place of racism in American culture. Um, you remember it was your environmental uh, analogy, environment, yeah. you know, and, right. and, and I asked you, you know, so do you want to say what the, um, what the, oh, analogy, the analogy was, was and, and yeah. because I think that it, it, go, it goes to this question about whether um, our work is about, on the one hand, the, work, the answer might be, right, that we're, we're not, that abolition is not, is not the vision, right? Abolition is not what's possible, mm -hmm. and that um, keeping racism at bay, right, mitigating racism. So where are you now today at quarter to seven on that? At four o'clock, you, <laughs> you, you had a powerful um, analogy there. Well, the, the analogy is not my, it's not, it's an analogy that stuck with me, but it's not, uh, it's not uh, mine originally. I was saying that I was, some years ago, when we were, um, Ford Foundation was a funder of, um, uh, Unnatural Causes, which is a film that, uh, that I was one of the producers, I was an executive producer for, and we were in a room full of Ford lawyers, and they were talking about the race, the work they were doing around racial injustice around the world, and, one, and they were all doing different kinds of pieces, and they're all extraordinary pieces, I mean, and difficult, and, and even dangerous, and just um, amazing work that they were talking about. They were just sort of reporting and sharing this. And at one point, someone uh, in the room was, listening to this litany of, 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 of sort of um, cases and setbacks and assaults and um, not individual, but sort of assaults on hum, human dignity. And, and, and he was basically saying, where does this end? What, what's, how do, when does this come to an end? And another person in the room, and I, can't, I wish I could remember his name, said essentially, you, you have to think about this in terms of, as an economic kind of, think of it as in terms of, a, of, a, of an environmental kind of a problem. It's not that there's a bullet or something that ends it, but if you think of it as an environmental problem, it's almost like there's a river, and we want the river to be pure. We want to drink the water. We all want to drink the water. People are dumping things into the water. It's, it requires vigilance and continual work. Sometimes the water's going to be really dirty, but we can sort of begin to find the sources of that dirt and begin to deal with it. Sometimes it'll be, but the idea is that it's not that there's an end. It sort of requires continual work and continual vigilance. And I think that's, that to me I found um, very realistic and somehow, not, not so much reassuring, but it was a different sort of way of thinking about why I'm doing the work that I'm doing. Because, you know, I, I, I take what you're saying in terms of, I take what you're saying in terms of uh, the, and also what you're saying, and it's what, what's come up several times, that we sort of know this, and we sort of, we, we, and, and sometimes it's sort of, when do we get, when does the things begin to click and things begin to sort of shift in a really dramatic, radical way, in which, so we can really begin to see progress. But I think part of it is there's continual work that has to happen because um, we're dealing with individuals and we're dealing with structures, and some of those structures have really long, long roots. Um, when Michelle Alexander is talking about the, the mass incarceration system, that's a, a long, ancient sort of a shadow that we don't even want to talk about in some ways that, goes, that does go back to, to, I think, slavery. Uh, so how do you begin to face those kind of challenges without sort of being ready to throw up your hands and find a corner? And I think that's the, this idea of, of, of sort of, a, of, of environmental, of, of thinking about the race question in terms of activism as a kind of an environmental question I thought was really quite affecting for me anyway. That's a long way to go to your... Um, and I think, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I do come back to as a touchstone question, I still sort of, 
I still sort of feel that way because otherwise, you know, is the answer then that I've got to sort of create a piece of work that actually I can actually see actually changes this or actually has this effect or actually, and I'm not sure that's the, I'm not sure that's what's in terms of my sense of work as a producer required of me, you know. Um, because if it was, I don't think it's something I can actually do. Here's the piece of work that's going to actually, you know, make a 90 degree turn in this. That's just not, I don't, I, I don't have that. I don't know what that subject is. Tell me. <laughs> I'll find the money. I'll make it. <laughs> this is going to be our last question. This is not an academic question. Can I ask it? No. Uh, I appreciate what you just shared about that environmental analogy. Because we're all, I feel very impatient. And the watching the film almost makes me more impatient. Um, but my question is that I am struck by this one moment in the film where one of your um, voices talks about uh, incarceration with a maybe. Uh, he says, there are people who believe, or I don't, I don't remember what he says exactly, but he isn't definitive about our, our structure of incarceration, even though Michelle Alexander is, mm. you probably are, mm. I am. And so I'm just wondering, back in the editing room, was there any conversation among you and your other producers about how to frame that? Because it seemed as if you softened it. I wish I could remember it. Does anybody else remember what I'm talking about? Is it a voiceover? No, it's uh, I'm sorry, is your it, main... Was it, was it a voiceover? No, he's It was speaking... a narrator. Was it, was it my voice or was it a narrator? I don't know if it was your voice, but it seemed like it was coming from the man with the very long dreadlocks. Uh-huh, yeah, Vince, okay. So he made remember, a statement yeah. about incarceration that was not definitive. He says some people argue that or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted a little backstory about why you decided to be so soft on that. That's a good, I wish I, wish I, had, the, I, wish I had the actual, I, I think I know what you're talking about. I think he's trying, I think what he's doing is he's beginning to set up what follows, which is Michelle Alexander's his, his social historical analysis of what, what we're actually seeing with, with mass incarceration. And I think that um, the only thing, I, the, I, What's, I think what's trick, what was, uh, if I remember correctly, I think part of what was, um, um, first of all, that's a statement from a much longer interview that we did, we did with him, and that was one of the things he was talking about was, was the same issue of mass incarceration. And I think that what we were trying to do is to use him to sort of set that up. But he's a historian, and actually his, 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 his area of expertise is, is um, uh, Caribbean history and slavery in the um, in in, in uh, the Caribbean. So he's trying to be careful about putting himself out there as a I think putting himself out there as a as a as a as an expert in this area. Um, in the film, we're asking him to do a number of different things, which he does very well. But he's also trying to be careful about saying that this is an area that he's really got as much expertise in as as Michelle Alexander. It's a it's a it's a it's 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 a place where we're really wanting him to 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 work. He would he's doing what a narrator would do, but um, maybe not as effectively, you know, in your view. Yeah, I mean, what I heard, you know, is is that there are um, there are 
variously interesting and not interesting academic debates that Michelle Alexander's thesis has generated. Um, and historians are right at the center of um, rethinking the ideas that she has so powerfully articulated. Um, so I, 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 so that's an academic answer, in a sense, to a question that I know wasn't about academics. But we could ask a question in, in this room, I think it would be a fair question about um, about that tension, right? It, which is to say about sort of academic thinking, which takes us back to Myrdal, right? You know, which is to say um, why Myrdal's ideas don't carry the day um, is that certainly um, in academic conversations, but not only, right, Laurie, in academic conversations, in political conversations, all of this is profoundly contested terrain, right? Which is to say, Myrdal is writing, um, and then we get, you know, we could we could ping pong between Myrdal is some version of the left and insight about race in America, and then we could pong back to, you know, Moynihan, you know, half a generation later, who takes us to another position. And we could go back and forth and appreciate, I think, that, um, one of the answers, I, I, I think, to the question about sort of how and why it is that these ideas don't get traction is that is that they're they're deeply contested and that that contest is undergirded by the equivalent of Carnegie, right, on the other side, right, to not only facilitate the studies but to promote the ideas, um, both in academic and in political and in popular culture. When I think about your film, and um, I think about how deeply um, insightful and persuasive it is. Um, I also know that then Americans flip, you know, 16 channels to the left or to the right, um, and they're watching eerily some of those very same scenes that you stage, right, could have been lifted from some reality TV program, right, about cops in America. And that's the, so it seems to me television is, is a battleground, right, and that's why it's hard for these ideas to carry the day in part because, for me, that's why, it, 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 for me, that's part of the reason it's hard for those ideas to carry the day is because we can flip the channel and someone is promoting a narrative that trades on some of the very same um, imagery um, and reads it in a very different way. Um, and so um, it, it seems to me you're working um, not only um, to um, educate another generation, right? It, right, that each generation has to learn this history and this story, and so there's that work, um, but that you're also um, bumping up against um, po other sorts of popular cultural representations and narratives um, that are interested in your questions but have a profoundly different, different spin, right? Completely different spin. So thank you so much, we're out of time, but thank you, Martha, thank you, Lou. And I just wanted to say some thank yous as well to Joy and Martha for joining us and to Lou for his very powerful film and also for taking the time to be with us this evening. Thank you all for joining us and for your comments and your questions. We hope you'll stay. We have a reception just outside the double doors to continue the conversation a little bit more informally. Please join me in a final round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.